everybody. Hi, hardly anybody, I mean. <laughs> you know, it's a real challenge to be the last session on such an intense uh, few days of conferences. Uh, my name is Vivian Forsman. I'm with Royal Roads University in Victoria, British Columbia. And I'm here to share with you uh, stories. But the first story I want to tell you, though, is that when I applied, uh, when I sent in an abstract to this conference, I actually thought the entire conference was about sustainability slash climate action and using OER to advance this cause. But that's not really what the conference is about, but that's OK. But I have been saying to people, some of you may be engaged in climate activism, and maybe you were on one of the climate strikes about three weeks ago in your city. And a popular sign in climate strikes is, there are no jobs on a dead planet. Well, I just want to co-opt that here. There is no OER on a dead planet. So let's work together to make sure we don't have a dead planet. On that note, let's go. So um, my name is Vivian Forsman. I work at the Resilience by Design Lab. I work very closely with Dr. Robin Cox, who is faculty at Royal Roads, and she's the director of this lab. She's a social scientist. I come out of a background of learning design, uh, knowledge management, knowledge mobilization, and educational technology. And we've made stuff happen because we've got that mix of skills. I also like to tell people that how I have pivoted my career is how everybody can pivot. Imagine somebody with a background in educational technology after five years being a leader in Canada around climate change. I just pivoted and lo and behold, my skills are applicable to climate change. Now, it looks like there's only two people that do the stuff I do, but that's not true because I've got Crystal Lambert sitting right here. And when you start to see some of the projects we've done, Krista has been one of the stars of the people we have contracted with to do all kinds of OER stuff on my project. So just because you see those two names doesn't mean that this is the only people that are involved with all the stuff I'm going to tell you about. Um, Royal Roads University is a small public university situated in Victoria, British Columbia. It's got this iconic castle that uh, movie makers come and use for a set. It's primarily focused on offering master's degree programs uh, to people that are in the workforce already. So they're basically online programs and then you come in for a couple of weeks of a resident residency experience. And so it really works well for working adults. And uh, the courses, like I say, are mostly delivered online. So uh, that is a basis for this. So Resilience by Design Lab, um, we've, we are completely focused on capacity building for climate action. And so this five-year list of things that you see up here, well, Krista, how many of those have you worked on? You've worked on getting our courses, in our OER courses into press books. You've worked on the Climate Action Competency Framework, I think, didn't you? No, really. Well, anyway, you've worked on a whole bunch of these things. And one of the ones that I have to draw your attention to that Krista and I did work on recently is the one at the bottom. We built a course for the federal gov Canadian federal government called Adapting to Climate Change. And it's supposed to be rolled out to all 240,000 public sector employees in Canada so they understand something about climate change. So we play around with lots of different opportunities in this area. So let's have some context here. What happened in the summer of 23? Is there a Brian Adams song about that? Um, it was crazy here in Canada. Uh, we couldn't breathe. There's a terrible, tragic story of a kid who had asthma who died in Kamloops this summer because he couldn't breathe because of the smoke. We've burned, we've scorched, we've ruined 5% of our forests. 200,000 people were evacuated. Uh, my daughter, who lives in Kelowna, and her family with three kids, they bunked in at my house for two weeks. Life was chaotic in my life. But of course, that's what you're going to do if you're evacuated. 6,500 fires. And that's just the fire stuff. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that happened. Devastating floods in Atlantic Canada, super storms charged up in uh, central Canada, in Ottawa. Nobody can ignore the fact that we are hit by climate impacts. So what do we do about this? Well, there's a huge need here within this community and others uh, to build societal know-how 
to deal with this crisis. The crisis is not going to be just dealt with with fire guides with long hoses. The, the solution to this problem is all of us need to be involved in whatever discipline. Just like what I said, I used to be in educational technology. I've pivoted to doing knowledge mobilization around climate change. And the, this thing that uh, Cable Green talked about yesterday is so spot on that open knowledge can help. And of course, he gave several examples of that. So first of all, I just want to put up this thing about climate action. Because sometimes when I talk to people about climate action, they think I'm just a climate activist out there with my sign that says there are no jobs on a dead planet. Climate action is the working part of dealing with the climate crisis. This is the stuff that we build in terms of new skills so that accountants know how to do GHG accounting, accounting so that engineers know how to build a bridge so that it doesn't get blown out by the next atmospheric river. Uh, climate action is about integrating all kinds of new skills into our society, policy, practice, all kinds of measures so that we can deal with this crisis. So it's not just me saying this. World Economic Forum had a report a couple of years ago that said two key things that is important for this community. They didn't say open, but they said we need short courses to upskill people. And climate action knowledge and skills is one of the most pressing world needs. So it's an important business. In the Canadian context, the team that I work with has just finished up this new report called Upskilling for Canada's Climate Transition. It's going to be released in November. Uh, we've made many recommendations, but the key one is that we need sector-specific understandings and upskilling. We need all kinds of action in the post-secondary sector to build courses to train people up on their role in the climate crisis. And so what I'm going to do, I can't release this yet because we're still getting a new cover for the report. We were really uh, didn't like this report. There's no uh, intersectionality in that picture. And it's about a bunch of boys in hard hats. And that's not really what this is about. But anyway, I'm going to post this up into the connecting uh, website when it becomes available. Because for those of you that are here and that aren't, this is an important thing for everybody that works in public sector or uh, post-secondary institutions and in NGOs. So more context here in Canada. The federal government published the Canada's National Adaptation Strategy. Uh, the final version came out in about April, a few months ago. And there's all kinds of stuff in this report demanding that we get our act together on sector-specific adaptation knowledge and skills. Now, just a quick um, primer. For those that aren't deep into climate action, there's kind of two sides to the coin. Climate change mitigation is controlling greenhouse gas emissions. Climate change adaptation is dealing with the compounding and cascading effects of climate change that we see in the headlines every day. Floods, fires, drought, heat domes, et cetera, et cetera. In the National Adaptation Strategy, maybe you can't read this, they say that by 2027, it's just about 2024. That's three years from now. In Canada, 75% of members of professional associations, engineers, planners, architects, so on, will have the right skills and capacity to apply climate change adaptation tools and information. Do you think they have that today? No. Do you think I'm busy trying to make sure they do by 2027? You bet. And I, I invite each of you to figure out where you might want to play in this huge momentum where we need to do this upskilling. So I talk a lot about capacity building. That's kind of a government term. Uh, workforce development, capacity building, they're kind of interchangeable terms. And capacity building really includes a range of different ways that we build knowledge through uh, training, development, through communities of practice, through uh, hanging out at conferences like this. We are part of a capacity building movement, so you'll hear me talk about that. So what are some of the challenges that we face in climate adaptation capacity building? Well, I'm going to go through this list of six different pieces. And I'm just putting that there for your quick read so that when I click through these slides, you know that we're getting near the end. Okay, so the first one is it requires a whole of society approach. No kidding. Uh, here we are, most of us are focused in the post-secondary sector, I believe, uh, but it's not just post-secondary, it's working professionals. We need to uh, build 
uh, momentum within our K-12 environment. We need uh, to uh, support populations with specific vulnerabilities, and it may not be through post-secondary education or formal training. It may be more community development approaches to capacity building. So whole of society needs to understand their role. And you know, the guy that was up here earlier, you know, saying what our greenhouse gas emissions were from being at the conference, and he said it was equivalent to 75 million phones being plugged in or whatever, whatever that means. Uh, I, I went out and I said to him afterwards, why don't you say that we used as much, uh, we, we spewed as much greenhouse gas emissions here as if there were 40 people driving fast Porsches to Toronto. That might have been a better metaphor. He also did not show that we'd burn so much greenhouse gases getting on airplanes coming here. These are the things we should be talking about. Complexity. Climate change is multi-sectoral, multi-dimensional, multidisciplinary. It's multi-everything. And so if we're going to build capacity in this game, we need everything from academic programming to applied skills. You know, when you think of here we are in Edmonton, uh, all these people that work at Fort McMurray in the bitumen mining business, uh, those people need a reset on new skills so they can m move into perhaps the now closed down renewable energy in Alberta. Yes, that's true. The Premier decided that uh, Alberta, even though it was leading on renewable energy, they closed it down because the oil patch doesn't like that. But we need applied skills training to make sure those people that are working in the fossil fuel industry can migrate into other jobs. We need competency frameworks to understand what are the skills that are required. We need all kinds of continuing professional development and communities of practice and peer networks. So there's a place for this for everybody, and I'm going to get to the open part soon, because the ideal world would be every piece of this would be developed as OERs. Keeping pace. I've got to tell you, I get sort of disappointed with our educational institutions, at least in Canada. Just about every uh, university and college in the country has a climate action committee. But you know what they talk about? EVs in the parking lot. Okay, so I thought post-secondary institutions' core purpose was teaching, learning, and research, not parking lot maintenance. And so it's great that they're putting in EV chargers, but we need to do so much more. So they're, typically, they're focused on changing energy consumption patterns, our universities. Uh, there's such a lag time on curriculum. You know, if you were to build a new master's program like we did at Royal Roads recently called the Master of Arts in Climate Action Leadership, you need a, at least a two-year timeline to build that, maybe longer in some jurisdictions because of all the curriculum committees and external parties that have to weigh in. We need to move fast, and going through these long lag times doesn't help. The structure of learning. As I put up earlier, that climate change is a very multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral issue, and so much of our teaching and learning in our post-secondary institutions is siloed into the school of engineering or the school of this or the school of that, when in fact we need a very transdisciplinary approach to this. Accessibility. Many of the courses that I've been involved with developing, we offer through continuing studies departments. They cost about 500 bucks each for a four-week course that can be used towards getting a micro-credential, but it excludes so many people that won't, can't and won't pay 500 bucks. And finally, fit. The perceived lack of fit or relevance to needs and learning styles. And I, I feel like that's what's happened here at this conference with only about uh, 15 people in the room, is that um, this is a really important topic. It's not just because I'm talking about it. We, we're all facing it, and we're hardly even, there's hardly anybody in the room. Okay, well, whatever, it's the last day. Meaningful reconciliation, as we've heard every day in this incredible conference, bringing in indigenous ways of knowing and perspectives is absolutely critical to this, and it is a fantastic opportunity to act with our reconciliation agenda. And there's so much knowledge and wisdom within our indigenous communities to inform how to deal with this climate crisis. And then finally, uh, not quite finally, lack of shared understanding of what's needed. You know, when I talk to people just on a casual basis about, so what are you doing either in your profession or your neighborhood or your home about climate change, 
people are like, they're floxomed about what to do. So that is a very universal problem, what to do. And, you know, it's easier, quite honestly, to do stuff in your workplace than it is to do stuff in your home. In your home, you need to put a solar panel on the roof, and maybe there's some subsidies in your neighborhood that allow you to do that, but that's still a big home renovation project. Uh, it's harder to do stuff at home than it is to do stuff in the workplace. Now, of course, you could be driving an EV uh, and parking it at the university with the plug-in, but anyway. Um, so, uh, lack of understanding. Okay, so, what have we done to address this? Well, uh, Resilience by Design Lab got funding from the Canadian federal government uh, starting in 2019, and we built all kinds of OERs. We have 11 courses that were co-developed in multiple universities in British Columbia, and we built all these courses on a range of different topics, and they're all up in the BC campus uh, press books uh, uh, platform. Now, that's something you did. Krista did a lot of background work here. And uh, they're a little bit hard to find in the BC campus uh, directory because they're not an open textbook, they're courses. And so if you just search for climate, you'll find them. And so that's one of the key things that we've had underway. Um, I just want to, I don't think Paul Stacey's in the room, but I just wanted to acknowledge that the inspiration for doing everything in OER came from my good friend, Paul Stacy, that we've known each other for years, and early in the game, I think I was going for a beer with Paul, saying, you know, he said, what are you up to these days, Vivian? What are you up to, Paul? And I told him, and he said, you got to do OER, Vivian, and so that's what we've done. And in addition to doing all these courses as OERs, we have also developed this Master of Arts in Climate Action Leadership as a complete open pedagogy master's degree. So thank you to Paul Stacy. Uh, I think this entire conference owes a lot to Paul Stacy. Okay, so here's the list. You can't really see it, I know, uh, but there's a bunch of courses that we've developed. There's two at the bottom that are awaiting being turned into OERs. One of them is a CCND. Uh, this is at the University of British Columbia. They were a little bit tepid about having their courses as CC BY. But anyway, there's a lot of courses there. They're all, all up in the thing. You know, here's the one that actually has been picked up and, and uh, reused is uh, climate change perspectives for project management. Uh, because project management is universal and it's an interesting course to evaluate what the risks are in your project that could be derailed by a climate impact. So that's one that's been picked up and uh, the person that developed that course was invited to Kenya to do a workshop. So there, some of them are being picked up, but as we all know in the OER game, never enough. So I just invite all of you that are in the room, if you wanna get underway at your university with some climate programming, just pull these things down, fix them up for your localized requirements and have at her. They're there, ready for use. In addition, we've acted like a little bit of an online program management organization. We've brought in NGOs that did not have access to a learning management system, and we've hosted a whole bunch of, of their courses at Royal Roads University using the Moodle learning management system. And we work very closely with this group called Climate Risk Institute, where their focus is on upskilling for uh, engineers and city planners. And so we have a lot of really detailed courses. Let me just give you an example of what this Pi VC protocol is that is taught to engineers. In engineering school, even today, uh, the design process is very much focused on historical data uh, for doing a uh, design of a bridge or whatever. And obviously, designing to historical uh, data doesn't make any sense. They, engineers need to design with climate data. Otherwise, they build a bridge that here in, well, in British Columbia will get blown out with the next, next atmospheric river. So engineers need to learn how to design using climate data, not historical data. So that's one of the courses we teach. Okay, so we have also worked very closely on building a micro-credential strategy. So all of those courses that you've seen on those lists can be uh, mixed up and aggregated uh, in groups of four to uh, earn a micro-credential. And uh, my, the micro-credential uh, thing means that we've had to build assessment into these courses uh, because that is what's required for a micro-credential. 
And an important part of this is that uh, all of this stuff ties in with a competency framework, and that is what uh, the British Columbia Ministry of Higher Education is really keen on, that if they're going to fund micro-credentials, they have to be tied to a competency framework. So we've, we've already got that. And also, so these micro-credentials can be used as if they were three credit courses within some of these master's programs at Royal Roads University. So we're really keen to use micro-creds as a way to invite people in and test out whether they feel comfortable with moving forward this kind of stuff and then go for it. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about this infrastructure resilience professional. This is the credential that Climate Risk Institute uh, awards people that complete their courses that are designed for engineers, very similar to a micro-credential with an awarded uh, recognition. Uh, we have brought in indigenous knowledges and perspectives into this portfolio. Uh, Janice Brooks is uh, uh, just such an interesting Indigenous woman who did all the development of this course and it speaks to what we heard in the keynote this morning that uh, when we develop courses around Indigenous knowledge they should be created by Indigenous people. This one is. I have a very uh, compelling video that I don't have time to show you here, but when I upload this whole thing into the uh, Connect thing, I will include uh, the video from Janice Brooks because it gives you a sense, it's very similar to what we heard here today, uh, of the importance of bringing Indigenous perspectives into the climate crisis. And we built this competency framework. We spent, it was such a big project. We interviewed, I think, 130 people globally that are experts in climate change adaptation to understand what are the competencies that we need to have as a foundation uh, that turns into learning outcomes, basically, in a course, so that what we're building in courses actually has relevance in the marketplace. So uh, we built the first round, we launched it, we used the eCampus Ontario uh, Open Competency Toolkit to do this, and we're now rebuilding it yet again with some new context. And there's a bunch of slides here that you can't possibly read, but just trust me, we built a competency framework. The latest thing that we're up to, thank you, is uh, we've put through a proposal to the federal government to fund a digital platform. I don't know if we're gonna get it, but we'll see what happens. And the stuff that's gonna be there is we've uh, got a tentative partnership with the company D2L, uh, who has a new product called Course Merchant. And we, they have offered to help us build a course and program portal that will house all Cor micro courses, microcreds, and academic programs, and NGO training that is related to climate change and sustainability across Canada. We think this is important because people, like perhaps those of you in the room, you know you'd like to get on board with this stuff. You know you need some new skills. You, it's hard to know where to start. And so we're going to have this portal so that you can scroll through easily with a nice tiled thing to see what's out there and what you can afford, both in terms of time and money, to get on board with the right skills to be part of addressing the climate crisis. Uh, there's also practitioner networks, communities of practice, and we're embedding some interesting AI into the platform should we get funding uh, to basically find experts on just about any topic. I know you can do that sort of through Google, uh, but uh, this will have uh, some kinds of you know, thumbs up on it so that you know that the person you're talking to about boreal forest drought in northern Alberta actually knows what they're talking about. And the Master of Arts in Climate Action Leadership. So, you know, I'm just about done with my time. I put this uh, QR code up. Uh, this is a two-year program, completely open, built in WordPress, built on the Climate Adaptation Competency Framework, and uh, it is uh, an open, it's CC BY. Anybody that wants to download bits and pieces of it, have at her. We feel that we have an urgent problem and this knowledge needs to be shared as openly and as quickly as possible. I'll just leave that up for anybody who's taken a picture of the QR code. Okay, one more person wants the QR code? There you go. I hope this QR code works. It's the first time I did this. Did it work? Okay, good. It was like I feel like I'm real cool now. I'm doing QR codes like everybody else. So in summary, huh, it's a problem. It's a, but it's a human problem. A lot of people think it's 
a scientific problem. When you look at climate data and you see those IPCC reports that are published, a lot of people probably think this is a technical problem. Well, the problem is us as we all flew to this conference, right? I know we are so hungry to get back to face-to-face. -to -face. We burned a lot of carbon, folks, getting to this conference. I, the climate change is a human problem, and there's so many dimensions of it. Uh, changing human behavior is really complicated. That's what all these courses that we're developing are basically about small pieces to help change human behavior. And uh, capacity building is a big project. And we're doing our best to bring in multiple perspectives, build par partnerships across jurisdictions. That's why we're working with this NGO called Climate Risk Institute, and on and on it goes. Okay, so I have exactly eight minutes left to hear from you, so thank you. Can you turn it off? Oh, whatever. Anybody have any questions or comments? After my, I feel like I'm on a bullet train here where, you know, we have half hour to tell complex stories and just like, okay, then done. So I'm giving you guys now seven minutes to have a conversation. Well, I think you did a great job. You're, <laughs> <laughs> it was exactly what I would expect from you, Vivian. That was uh, fantastic. My question and my, my, the thing that I'm running into at, at most institutions in Ontario is, I think there are two pain points. You pointed to one of those. That was the curriculum stuff, and it seems to be really difficult to get anyone to give up space. They, they see it as giving up space in their curriculum, and I don't know how we get them past that. The second is procurement. Procurement is, could be massively powerful, should be massively powerful, and yet we still have universities building buildings that have zero um, thinking around climate change in them, and I just don't understand how we get people past that. Yeah. Well, your first, your first point, uh, I went to a session a half an hour ago, and Ulrich is here, aren't you? Uh, at the University of Saskatchewan, they've created faculty fellows, Ulrich is one of them, uh, whose job it is is to showcase SDGs in their curriculum, but uh, Ulrich is showcasing climate action as one of them, and they have a sort of a longer-term plan to take the knowledge of these, what, about eight or 10 faculty fellows and take that experience out to the faculty. That's really valuable. It's also too slow. <laughs> you know, um, it is the fall of 2023. And by the fall of 2024, in a perfect world, every piece of curriculum in our post-secondary institutions should have some hook into the climate crisis. And, you know, this is sort of sounds like, um, you know, chasing ambulances. But the best time to talk about in, in, integrating climate into the curriculum is when your town is flooded. <laughs> you know, now is the time. Let's get going here, folks, right? And so the good news is, over the next 12 months, uh, there will be 12 crazy crises in Canada that are climate-based. And every time one of those happens, it's time to go to your provost and say, hey, don't you think we need to integrate some new skills and knowledge about this never-ending crisis that we're in? So that's that. The building thing, you know, just as a point of fact, one of the courses we have is about procurement uh, for climate change. Maybe we need to get the procurement people in every post-secondary institution to take that course. I agree. So anyway, <laughs> download it for your university, uh, localize it, and have at her. Thank you. Any other comments and questions? Yes. I, I just want to clarify that it's in the Pressbooks directory, not the BC Campus collection at the moment. But it's in BC Campus Pressbooks. Thank but you. But in the Pressbooks directory. <laughs> Thanks, Krista. <laughs> I have one thing for you. I can't see. Those lights are crazy. Oop, sorry about that. Hi, over here on the, to your right. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Vivian. Thanks so much for your talk. I am associate faculty at Royal Roads. I teach in the Mallet program, instructional design. So I'd love to be a partner and help in any way what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and maybe we can talk offline about this. But um, I'm, uh, I went, as soon as you said D2L, I had a heart attack. <laughs> they're proprietary, uh, not, you know, no offense to anyone at D2L, they're proprietary for profit company, unlike uh, building things in Moodle or WordPress or Pressbooks. 
Uh, I feel like once you put things into that LMS, it will be hard to get them out. Okay, let me explain why we did that. First of all, we're not talking about Brightspace. We're talking about a new product they have called Course Merchant that they just bought this company. I agree, they're a for-profit company. You know why we chose them? Because the federal government uses Course Merchant and D2L and my hook to get the federal government to pay attention to this proposal is to let them know that we're going to use the same technology that they're using in-house and the 245,000 employees that work for the federal government, they have the Canada School of Public Service with the tiles that look like blah, blah, blah. And what we are proposing is that they toggle out and they will find a very similar user experience using Course Merchant. And it's really nothing more than a uh, funding and political play to use this. If I thought there were, you know, originally we did a prototype of a course catalog in WordPress and realized this is too complicated, it's not sustainable, and there may be other products that are more open in, you know, out there. We didn't look at it, we haven't been funded yet, so if you've got some good ideas, sure, I'd be very interested to know, but the real reason we said we were partnering with D2L is to get the federal government's attention because they already have a license for it. Aha, uh -huh. no, that sounds like a very sound strategy. Thanks for clarifying, Vivian. Yeah. But I agree with you. We don't want stuff behind firewalls. I agree. Hi, um, I'm from Uruguay, and I was looking at those open courses and wondering how much of that could be used in Uruguay or in any country in Latin America. Of course, it would have to be translated to Spanish or Portuguese, uh, and that we could do. But also, I was thinking about the content, how much of that goes beyond the specific case of Canada? Great question. Uh, certainly, the Indigenous Perspectives course is very localized knowledge, basically bringing in Indigenous knowledge that is primarily Western Canadian. So that course, probably not. But you know, for those of you who have been involved with course design and development, you know the challenge. The first step is just getting some structure to what it is you want to build. Well, these courses all have, at the very baseline, some structure, okay? Uh, the next step, of course, in the case of Uruguay, is to translate into Spanish and por or, or Portuguese for Brazil. Um, you know, I, I don't know, put it through one of the, <laughs> the Google tools these days and then fix it up, right? And then uh, that's the whole point of open educational resources is go in and localize it, but at least you've got maybe 50% of the structure. So instead of it taking eight, to eight months to 12 months to build a course, maybe you can do it in three or four months because you've already got the structure. Well, like all good sessions at this conference, my time is up because other people want to get on the next train. So thank you for your participation. I'm going to post all this stuff up into Connect. And uh, I'm Vivian. I'm easily found on LinkedIn. And I'm always game to help others try to build momentum around this urgent issue of upskilling for climate change. Thank you very much.